Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Church, uh, before we jump into our text this morning, I just need to thank you for your kind attention uh, to me this week uh, with the passing of my father-in-law and everything that we've been doing as a family, being up in in Honey Grove for the week. And we certainly have felt your prayers and your kind attention. Uh, Please continue to pray, uh, not only for me and my wife, but uh, particularly for uh, the family there in Honey Grove. And so uh, it's been, it's been a heck of uh, six months with the, with the loss of my father and, and now my father-in-law. And so um, having preached both of their funeral services in a short span of time, uh, I figured uh, that this morning we would look at a very special passage of Scripture, uh, John chapter 11. So turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 11 where Jesus is going to exclaim this incredible truth that he is the resurrection and the life. Hold your spot there in John 11. We're gonna walk through this narrative together. Let me read the first seven verses and then we'll get started. Now, a certain man was sick Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him saying, Lord, behold, he who you, whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go up to Judea again. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, as we talk about death and the truth and the promise of who your son is and who you are. Father, I know all across this room that even the subject of death makes so many of us uncomfortable. It is a certainty and yet We so seldom talk about it. We don't like to think about it. Father, I also know all across this room, there are many who are filled with confusing thoughts and even guilt surrounding some of their loved one's death. Father, I pray that this passage where your son addresses death head on, Father, I pray that that truth would bring healing and peace, that your Holy Spirit would begin to mend and to heal deep wounds in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. It's probably helpful at the beginning for me to go ahead and talk about some of the uh, cultural differences or practices that you will find woven in this text that for us may seem a little bit odd, a little bit out of place, but they'll help you to understand the narrative. Uh, The Jews culturally 
uh, were very expressive, and particularly in regards to death. Now, not all cultures uh, act or respond in the same way. Some cultures show their, uh, their strength or their honor by keeping strong, by showing no emotion, by, by just being a little more stoic. Well, not the Jews. Uh, there, there are many cultures who are very expressive and part of their display it would be showing their love for their loved one uh, by expressing emotion in the midst of death. Uh, the Jewish culture in the first century, they, they would actually hire uh, professional mourners. They would hire uh, flute players who would come and, and play somber depressing music, and they would hire professional mourners or wailers, criers, that would help you cry, help you express your own emotion because they would provide a safe place where others were crying, and therefore it would allow the loved ones to freely express themselves. So you'll see a little bit of that detail woven in. Now, we have to be honest as a culture about how little we talk or address death. It makes us uncomfortable. We keep every, everything an arm's length away. Everything is so prim and proper with our preserving of the body, with makeup and making everything look ever so right, it's always an arm's length away. I say that to you this morning, not to make you feel uncomfortable, but to say inherently in our culture, because we keep death an arm's length away, it's not always a good thing. Because the truth of the matter is, is Death is inevitable. It is promised to each and every one of us. The death rate is still 100%. You are going to die unless Jesus comes back first. Amen. It's an incredible passage that John articulates for us. I want to point your attention to verses 5 and 6. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. So, he, so when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. <coughs> now, I'm going to come back to the fact that that's very confusing to a lot of people. But I want to go ahead and give you a cultural explanation, kind of the what's behind the scenes of why this matters. If you, if you figure out Jesus is about a four days journey away from Lazarus, the Pharisees have been seeking to kill him because of his claims to be the son of God. Just prior to this in John, they had picked up stones and they were going to kill him because of his claim to be God. So Jesus has moved into the far northern regions and he was awaiting coming to Jerusalem because what he would know, it was ultimately going to be his end. Lazarus is sick. He is on his deathbed. And so the family sends a messenger up on a four days journey to give word to Jesus. Jesus gets the word and John says, because he loved Lazarus and Mary and Martha, he stayed two days longer. Then upon, I guess, supernaturally knowing that Lazarus had died, he takes the four days journey and he shows up after Lazarus has been in the grave for four days. Now, you can do the math. If he had just gone immediately, he would have showed up and Lazarus would have been in the grave two days. 
And you say, well, what's the big difference between showing up when Lazarus is two days dead or four days dead? Well, there's something important that goes on culturally. That is, you have to understand, uh, in the ancient world, they buried someone that very day, right? They, They didn't have the embalming practices that we did. The most they had was a little oil and a little herbs just to cover up the stench because decay would immediately set in. And you weren't waiting for people to travel from all sides of uh, to get there. Everyone was already there. So the, if you died, the, the burial would take place that day. But occasionally you would get it wrong on the fact that they were actually dead. I mean, in today's culture, you, you, can't, you can't die without a heart monitor, you know, saying, all right, it's, it's flatlined and the justice of the peace come and declares and, and you have all of this. But in, in, in those days, there, there was certainly an aspect of if, you're, if your breathing slowed down or some of those things. And so occasionally you would have these instances where they're carrying a body and then you, you get a a knock on the casket that says, wait a second, don't do it too quickly, right? Well, kind of a a folklore or uh, old wise tales had risen up in the first century to explain some of these occurrences. And, And that was that when you died, your soul or spirit just hovered over around the body for the first three days, okay? Now, Jesus didn't believe this. It's not what the Bible teaches, but culturally, there is this wise tale, this understanding. So if Jesus shows up after two days, resurrects Lazarus from the dead, you get a, all right, yeah, that was a pretty big deal, but you know, It's happened before. But culturally, after three days, after a certain amount of decay had set in with the body, that was it, right? Which is why in the narrative, you hear Martha say, wait a second, I mean, it's a hot climate. Four days in the grave, the decay that set in with no possible preservation, it's pretty bad. So John ties it together. Jesus loved Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And so he waited two extra days. Now, we can understand that theologically, really detached from the text. We can, you know, the lawyer in us can go, all right, it kind of makes sense, right? But, and you've probably heard this passage preached time and time again. But listen to me, this made no sense to the disciples. Think of that. The disciples are sitting there. They get word, Jesus, Lazarus, whom you love, is sick. I mean, don't you drop everything and go? But he sits around for two extra days. Imagine Mary and Martha. They sent a messenger, knowing it would take four days to get to Jesus. They are filled with anticipation, an inkling of hope as their brother is on his deathbed, as he takes every breath hoping that he will hold on just in enough time for Jesus to return. And then suddenly their hopes are dashed. And then two days later, the messenger returns. But Jesus isn't with him. What goes through their mind? As day three and day four. 
Where is he? Does he care? Believer, this scripture passage is written and preserved for you and you have the angle and the ability to look at God's word and understand God has a plan and a purpose regardless of whether you can see it or whether you understand it. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. God is in control. He is on his throne, even in death. He who is the sovereign creator is in control. Psalm 139, verse 16. Does it not declare that from the foundation of the world, every one of our days has been written in his book of life? He has planned it from the beginning. Church, you know why this matters? Because I can't tell you the number of times where me as a pastor as I go to console loved ones in the family. And in the days and the weeks and in the months and even years that follow, do I hear, what if? What if? What if he had been on a different medication? What if someone had been there at just the right time. What if, what if that driver had not crossed that center line? What if? What if I had been able to do more? What if I should have seen this coming? What if, what if, what if, what if? Listen to me. Because the enemy is not your friend. He will not comfort you. In fact, he will tell you lies from the absolute pit of hell. Every one of their days has been written in God's plan, in his book, from the foundation of the world. You cannot steal or cheat one of them. Do you hear me? My mother-in-law was there when my father-in-law passed away. And in the days following, my wife and I continually reminded her of this very truth. And I can't think, I can't help but think in a crowd this size, how many are walking around carrying guilt and shame unnecessarily because you allow what if theology and you allow the enemy to press lies into your mind when the reality is you have a sovereign creator who has a plan and is always on his throne and you can trust him. That's what the scripture passage shows. You can trust him. Did he not give his son for you? You can trust him. So Jesus gets up And he makes the four days journey. He makes his way to Bethany, which is just right outside of Jerusalem. And I want you to notice that Martha sees him coming down the road. Remember, it's now day four. And Jesus did not get there as soon as he possibly could. He waited and they don't understand why. And Martha sees him down the road and she leaves the house. She leaves the mourners and she runs to meet him on the road. Truth be told, she's a little angry. She has questions. 
She meets Jesus on the road. My brother could be living if you had been here. If you had been here. And her mind races with questions. Mary's going to ask the very same question, but her tone's going to be completely different. What I need you to hear and what I need you to understand is Jesus' shoulders are broad enough, he's strong enough to handle all of your anger, all of your venom. He responds to Martha with the promises of God. Because she wants to know, why did it have to be this way? Couldn't it have been different? Where were you? If you loved him, you would have been here. She's got so many questions. And we're going to come back to this truth because it's, well, frankly, one of the most incredible truths that you'll ever understand. And then as Jesus is still there where Martha is, and after the dialogue, listen as I read verses 32 through 35. Therefore, when, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews who came with him were also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled and said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. See, Martha was angry, filled with questions, filled with, where were you? But Mary She was just broken. Her heart was broken. And as Jesus meets her, as he hears the pain in her voice, as she falls at his feet weeping, as he surveys the entirety of the scene, Listen to me. He knows he's about to raise Lazarus from the dead, doesn't he? I mean, those were the promises and the dialogue that he had just had with Martha. And what Martha needed to hear was the promises of God. But as he sits there with Mary... He wept with her. He wept with her. He didn't say, hold on, hold on, hold on, watch this. He wept with her. The same one whose shoulders are broad enough to handle every bit of venom that you could ever have about your circumstances and trials in life is also tender-hearted, gentle and lowly and weeps in the midst of all your hurt and all your pain. Look with me at verses 20 through 27. Because we go back to his dialogue with Martha where he begins to unfold the promises. And as we go back to his dialogue, Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him. But Mary stayed at the house. Martha said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. You need to understand that Martha is speaking in generalities. 
she has no clue, no anticipation that Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Okay, you say, how do you know that? Well, because in verse 39, it's Martha, as Jesus says, roll the stone away. That's like, "Uh uh-uh, don't do that. So she's just speaking in generalities. Jesus responds to her in verse 23. Your brother will rise again. He gives no indication in that statement of what he's about to do. In verse 24, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. What you need to understand here is that the Old Testament view of death is vague at best. It's not clearly nice and neat and ironed out. It's the reason that the Pharisees and the Sadducees had so much debate about whether there even was a resurrection of the dead. At best, what you can figure out the view of death in the Old Testament is that all deceased go to the place of Sheol, the grave, and all go to the grave that there may be a separation of a good side of Sheol and a bad side of Sheol. But it's a little more than the idea of soul sleep until the very end of the age. And so whatever it is, Martha's view of the end and the promise of resurrection, it's about this helpful for her in that moment. There's no real peace. There's no real comfort. All she wants is her brother back, alive, holding on to the little life that might be left. Just let him come back. There's no real peace and assurance with her view of the end. And so she makes the statement, sure. He will resurrect on the last day. Now watch this, because there's scarcely anything greater in the whole of scripture than these two verses. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He makes two statements here, that he is the resurrection and he is the life. When he says that he is the resurrection, it's the second half of 25. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. That's what he means by the statement of he is the resurrection. A statement that he is so identified with resurrection, there is no concept of resurrection outside of him. Let me illustrate that for you really quickly, and I hate to do this, it burns me inside, but think of Alabama football. (laughs) If Nick Saban, who's won however many national championships at this point, were to say to you, go on national conference, uh, national television, and and someone asked uh, uh, about Alabama football and whether he was going to retire or anything like that, and he looked at the camera and he said, I am Alabama football, you would all understood what he means, right? He means that the whole idea of everything that has become Alabama football and every year they're in the national championship, It's all tied to him. That there is no concept of Alabama football the way that it is without him. Jesus' statement about resurrection at the end of all of eternity, he looks at Martha and he would look at you and he would simply say, I am the resurrection. All resurrection goes through me. There is 
no resurrection. There is not even the concept without me. But he doesn't stop there. Because he also says, and I am the life. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. What he means is that to know Jesus is to be spiritually and eternally alive. from the moment that you know him. So when I was 15, I placed my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. John 17, three says, to have eternal life is to know God, to know him. So I preached this passage at funerals. And I point to the casket and I say, this loved one who died in Christ is more alive now than they've ever been. They don't want to come back to you. They are more alive now than they've ever been. But listen to me, you believer. The same is true to you. I know you have a leaky bucket and I know that you are still in flesh and it weighs you down, but this truth is no truth the less. Listen to me. If you know him, you are eternally alive. Though the body fade, though it continues to break down, you are alive. And just to prove this point, Jesus walks over to the grave and raises Lazarus. Just to prove this point, that he is the resurrection and the life, he walks over to the grave and says, let me show you how alive Lazarus is. Let me show you so that you understand that he is resurrected, that he is eternally alive. Come on. Lazarus, come forth. Jesus, don't do that. He smells the body's decay. Come on. He's alive. At the end of verse 26, Jesus looks at Martha and says, do you believe this? And I look at you this morning and say the very same thing. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Then Christians, why is death so taboo? Why is it so taboo? In this life, you are guaranteed death and taxes, but we only talk about one of those things. Why? Our culture has become so uncomfortable. I mean, you want to suck the air out of the room? You want to make people feel uncomfortable? Talk about death. Because we keep everything an arm's length away, and we don't know how to deal with it. We don't know how to talk about it. But it should not be that way amongst us. As Christians, as believers, death is certain to every single one of us. There will one day be a ceremony and a service for you. We have to have the ability to talk about it, to engage one another. To ask the question, do we die well? Some time ago, I was reading through a great book that surveyed 
the prayers of Paul in the New Testament. Just went through every prayer in the New Testament of all of Paul's letters. And I realized something startling in there. There are only a handful of times that Paul prays for his circumstances to change. Do you know that? Go through all sorts of trials, all sorts of tribulations. Only a handful of times does he pray for his circumstances to change. Overwhelmingly, he prays for faith in the midst of the trial. As he prays for himself and as he prays for other people. Now listen to me. I'm not saying you can't pray for your loved one to be healed. I'm not saying that. You can pray for healing and for length of days. But as a mature believer, shouldn't we pray more and more that our loved ones would die well? The Puritans had a robust theology about dying well, about holding up the promises of Jesus. In the midst of suffering and in the midst of death, you have an opportunity to highlight the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ unlike any other time. And as believers, we should pray that other Christians and that our loved ones would die well. So this is my charge to you today, that we would talk about death And as we do, you can't help but drink deeper and more full of every day that you have. Every day that you have. All right, I'm running out of time. I like to do that. We have the honor and privilege of moving towards the Lord's Supper. But mentally, as we move towards the Lord's Supper, I need to remind you of a few things. You can start working on the, the package and you can get the bread out and we'll hold it and we'll take that together. The Lord's Supper is only offered towards those who have been born again. They've placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Parents, I would ask that you would uh, steward your children. You know whether they've been baptized and whether they've placed their faith in Jesus. There's one last thread I wanna highlight as we move through John 11. And it's this truth. John began, there, there are seven miracles in the book of John. And the first miracle in John chapter two was the wedding at Cana. And do you remember what Jesus said to his mother? He said, my time has not yet come. Hold off, my time has not yet come. But by the time we get to the seventh miracle, and as Jesus is making his way to Bethany, which is just outside of Jerusalem, the disciples warn him, hey, if you go to Jerusalem, you know what's gonna happen. Jesus does know what's gonna happen. This is the incredible, just beauty of Jesus and his life, that he would go to Bethany and Jerusalem in order to raise Lazarus from the dead and give him life, and he knew that it would ultimately cost his own life. He knew that his journey to give you and I and Lazarus resurrection life would cost his own life. He knew that his time had come. 
And so as you have the bread elements in front of you, As you hold it, you understand the truth that in order to forgive your sins, he became your sin. He who is the resurrection and the life had to lay down his life. What an incredible statement. So the scripture warns us to never take this in an unworthy manner. So I'm going to give you a few seconds to contemplate yourself right there in your seat, in your pew. Lay down your sin before the cross. Confess to him who is worthy. Confess to he who is the resurrection and the life. Mark says, while they were eating, he took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and he gave it to them and said, take it. This is my body. Now you can start to work on the cup. What's so overwhelmingly just magnificent is that this cup represents Yes, his blood, but also the victory. The victory. And so here in a moment, as you drink it, I want your mind, I want these words to just radiate. I am the resurrection and the life. And he allows us to partake of that victory. He came to set us free, to call us out of the grave. And this is a a remembrance that in him, we are eternally alive. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them. And they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you. Lord Jesus, we praise you. We celebrate your resurrection and our promised resurrection. We celebrate because we know that you have made us eternally alive because we know you. Father, I pray if there is anyone here under the sound of my voice that does not know you, that they would place their faith in you right now, that they would see the truth of the cross, that they would hear these words, that you are the resurrection and the life. And Father, I pray that us as Christians who have the promises, who have the hope, that we would be able to shine our light into a culture that is so afraid of death. 
that will never talk about it. But Father, your gospel gives us victory. Knowing you is our eternal hope. Father, I pray all across this room that there would be those who are healed by this sermon because you are the resurrection and the life. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen.